Hey guys, how's it going? I'm back here with another video. And in today's video, I'm going to be bringing a recently much requested tutorial where I'm going to be going from zero to explaining everything I believe you should learn in order to say that you understand and know how to use TypeScript. For those who don't know, TypeScript is an open source programming language developed and maintained by Microsoft. It is basically a superset of JavaScript, which means that any valid JavaScript code is also valid TypeScript code. TypeScript is a better version technically of JavaScript because it adds things that JavaScript can't have, like static type definitions, allowing us developers to be able to define each variable with their specific type. And when you actually compile your TypeScript code, um, everything will become JavaScript. But the, the point of using TypeScript is not for the end user, it is for us developers to prevent ourselves from making mistakes that would then cause issues to the client and the users who are using our website. Therefore, TypeScript makes one of my favorite programming languages, which is JavaScript, be even better. So if before this video you had any ounce of doubt of whether you needed to learn TypeScript, I'm assuring you that you do need it. And if you want to become a web developer in today's day and age, especially with how competitive the market is there, you need to be up to date with the most reliable and used technologies. And TypeScript is on the top of the list. So because I know it's annoying to learn <laughs> new technologies, especially in the beginning, um, I compiled this video, which um, I will structure it in a way such that if I was the one learning TypeScript again from the beginning, how would I approach this? Now, do you need to know JavaScript for this course? Well, I will assume you know the basics because I do think JavaScript is important to learn in its core uh, before learning TypeScript. Because at the end of the day, TypeScript isn't a replace, like it isn't some, any different from JavaScript in the sense that the syntax is the same. The only difference is the extensions that you apply. So the things you add, not actually the things you already did in JavaScript. And you'll understand as we go on through the video. And before we get into this video, if you could leave a like and subscribe, I would massively appreciate it. This video is not sponsored, but if you want to help the channel, uh, you could support the channel by checking out one of our partners, uh, which is Hostinger. Uh, I've talked about them a bunch of times in my channel already. You can check out my link in the description if you're looking to host your website in any place. They have a really good service and I would appreciate it if you could check them out. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it. Let's get into the tutorial. Okay, everyone. So right off the bat, I explained to you guys uh, what TypeScript is and uh, why I think you should use it. So now uh, let's get into the practical stuff. So first off, we need to install TypeScript. I opened up here VS Code, and this is where we're going to be running our application. Um, if you know how to run JavaScript applications, you might know that there's two ways to do it. You can either run it in a browser by just using normal JavaScript and having an HTML page. However, for aesthetic purposes and for simplicity reasons, I actually want to run my TypeScript and my JavaScript all inside of my terminal. And we do this by utilizing Node.js. So I will create um, a file over here called tutorial.ts. Now this will be the file where all of our code is going to be written. Um, if you notice immediately, we use a TS extension instead of a JavaScript, a GS extension, because uh, this will help us distinguish this from a JavaScript file. And here is the file. Now we need to actually install TypeScript inside of our computer. All computers, I believe, come with JavaScript, but TypeScript uh, definitely needs to be installed. Now, in order to install it, you have to use a package manager. Um, let's assume you're using npm and run npm install g to install this package globally, and then TypeScript. Now, I've obviously already installed this, so I'm not going to run that. However, after you do you did that, you should run the command tsc then dash dash init. What this is going to do is it will help us generate our TS config file, which is a JSON file, um, which includes a bunch of configuration stuff related to how we want to manage our TypeScript code. The file includes settings for various compiler options, such as which files to include or exclude, the target JavaScript version that you want your TypeScript code to run with, and additional checks like if you want your TypeScript uh, application to actually be very strict with the typing rules or uh, maybe not so strict. 
Um, essentially, it's kind of like a roadmap for the compiler detailing all the rules that you want your TypeScript code to follow. Now, by default, you see there's a bunch of configurations already set up for us. Um, thing is, I actually want to check and you can see this uh, strict true over here uh, should be set to true for this tutorial because you actually want to enable all checks for TypeScript. So if you put this to false, it, it will basically um, allow you to write your code in TypeScript, but it will also allow you to not add type definitions to every single variable you create or every single function you create, which kind of goes a bit against of why you're using TypeScript. Sometimes I use this just when I'm annoyed and I'm just trying to build a quick project. However, um, I definitely recommend setting this to true. So I'm going to keep this as it was. I'm going to save this and let's start working on the code. Right off the bat, I want to introduce you guys to um, the different type annotations that come with TypeScript. So we all know how to define a variable, right? If I wanted to define a variable called age or ID, I could come over here and say ID is equal to five, right? However, in TypeScript, this isn't how it works because although uh, JavaScript would assume that this is a number, we have to make sure to let our code know that this is a number. So in order to let TypeScript know that this variable should be considered a number, we would have to come over here and define this variable as an actual number. So as you can see in TypeScript, we add the types for each variable just like this. And you actually see this whenever you're just writing normal JavaScript. If you hover over a variable, you can see it assumes that the variable is equal to this. However, us defining it instead of letting JavaScript assume will help us prevent future bugs that we might not even be thinking of. So we definitely want to keep this as a number. Now, what other variables we could define? Well, we could define a string. For example, we could define a variable called company and set it equal to, um, I don't know, Acme Corporation, right? Now, how would we define this type as string? Well, we just come over here and define it as a string. Same goes with a Boolean. Um, let's create a Boolean called is published or something like that. And we would define it to be a Boolean by just setting the Boolean type. Now I'll continue on with a couple other types and just go over what each of them do. Okay, so I added three more types over here and I'll go over what each of them mean. So right off the bat, if you want to define an array of a specific type, the way you do it is by writing the type first and then putting open and square and closing square brackets just like this. So this would be to define an array of numbers, just as we do over here. If I wanted to make this into an array of strings, I would do this. Now immediately, you notice that when I try to change the type definition it starts giving us some squiggly lines over here, which says that the type number is not assignable to the type string. So you can see the power of TypeScript because anytime you mistakenly uh, define variables with um, the wrong type, it will actually let you know if this was JavaScript, this would allow us to do it uh, no matter what, right? I mean, JavaScript even allows you to do something like this over here, which is um, having an array with different types inside of it. Now, necessarily here, it doesn't give you a red squiggly line because there's a specific type in TypeScript called the any type, which as you might know, it just defines a variable as any of the types. So this variable x over here, because I set it to any could actually be a number, it could be a Boolean, it could be, um, I don't know, an array if I wanted to. Um, and it kind of defies a bit the point of TypeScript. So you might see some any's in some projects. However, usually people use any whenever they are just they, 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 they don't want to actually define the real type, or they're confused with the real type, or they just are annoyed with TypeScript and don't actually want to uh, learn what the actual type is. So this over here should only be used, the any type should only be used in extreme scenarios. Um, and obviously there's other specific scenarios where you definitely want to use it, but I'm just saying in general, I would only keep that for extreme scenarios where you actually don't know the type. Now this is cool. However, how would this work with some actual functionality? Well, if I were to create a function, right? Let's create over here a function and let's call it concatenate strings, or actually let's call it concatenate values. That would be better. And let's make it such that this function takes in 
two variables a and b and it returns the two values um, concatenated so for those who don't know the word concatenate basically is usually used for strings so if I, if a over here was the word hello and b was the word world the result of this function should be hello world right so you can see there is a red squiggly line here because it is immediately telling us that we actually didn't define any type for it. And it is actually in assuming that it has an any type, which isn't allowed in strict mode. So we would have to define a type. But before we actually do that, let's see what would happen in two scenarios that I think will exemplify to you guys uh, situations in which JavaScript could cause some issues. So let's actually console uh, log over here. Um, the result of this function and first, let's call it using hello, and then world, just like we said before. And then let's actually try to put a number here instead of a string, let's put five and 10. Right. So thing is, five and 10 are numbers, not strings. So if we're taking the function by what it actually is saying that it's doing, which is just getting two strings and adding them together, technically, this over here should return 510. Right? However, since these are numbers, um, and we haven't defined a specific type here, this will actually return five plus 10, which is not 510, it is 15. So you see that if I run this file, and for those who don't know, if you're trying to run a node.js file locally, you just run node, and then you run the uh, tutorial, uh, you run the, the file like this, um, you can see that yeah, we get hello world and 15, not 510. So we definitely want to define a type for this function. And the way we define types for arguments of functions is just like how we define for the variables over there, we just put over here, the the values. So I'll say string, and I'll say string, perfect. And now you should see that we it gives us a, an error over here, because we're actually putting five and 10 as numbers. So we know that if we want to get the result that we wanted, we had to do something like this. And now if we were to come over here and run node index .ts, or tutorial .ts actually, you should actually see an error. And the error is pointing to the fact that uh, we're putting TypeScript in a file that Node.js doesn't know how to read. Because Node.js, like I said, isn't going to compile or isn't going to read and run the TypeScript code in itself, it actually runs JavaScript. So we actually have to compile this into a JavaScript file to be able to run with the job with the TypeScript notation. So in order to compile this tutorial.ts file into a JavaScript one, we can run um, TSC. And you'll see that it automatically generates this file as a JavaScript file. So it's basically the same thing as before, but without the type annotations which means that um, this is what is going to be read by the browser, this is what is going to be read by the server if we're, we're deploying this to a server. So the benefit of TypeScript goes in this file. And if we want to run our result, we actually need to run the JavaScript one. So I'll say node index.js and um, oh, what happened? Um, module not found. Oh, I keep putting uh, index.js. Let's do tutorial.js. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, you can see it correctly said 510, which is perfect. Now, one thing I want to point out to you guys is, um, what if what if I actually return something else? What if I return the, the, the number three? This obviously is wrong, right? Because how can this we're expecting a string, not a number. So there is a way for you to define um, the return type of a function. And the way you do that is by adding the return type over here. So we'll say that the return type for this function is a string, so that um, our code knows that this is what it's supposed to return. Now, if I were to put three or four over here, it would give us an error on the return statement, um, telling us that we can't actually return a number. Perfect. Now that we've learned the basics of the basics, let's start getting where uh, TypeScript gets really interesting, which is when we actually start defining objects and types ourselves. So whenever we have an object in JavaScript, right? So if I were to define the object user, we could put various different fields inside of here, we could put an ID, right, which would be um, 
a number, we could put a name, which would be a string. And we can also put, for example, an age, right, which would be um, a number. So this object over here could be defined in a certain way. But then you could right after this come here and change one of the values to something that doesn't make sense, right? Now it says over here that you can't do that because a string is not assignable to a number. It is assuming that our user object is defined this way. And it's actually helping us by uh, by giving us a red squiggly line telling us that this shouldn't happen. However, we shouldn't let JavaScript assume anything, we should define the type for this object ourselves. And the way I would define a type for an object is by using an interface. So an interface is basically um, a roadmap, a blueprint for how our object should look like. So I'll call this interface, the user interface. And inside of here, we should define all of the fields that our user has. But instead of putting the values for each of the field, we should put the types. So for ID, it will be number for age, for name, it will be string. And for age, it will be number as well. Now you can see that um, if I were to put this, it will still say you can't, um, but we actually haven't assigned this object to this interface. That's why if I were to actually make this into a string, this would work. However, we don't want to allow a user to be defined with an age, which is a string. So we say that this user has type user interface. So now it gives us the error, which means that just like how we were defining variables before, um, by giving the string type, we can now use uh, a personalized type that we create to enforce type definitions. Now let's fix this by just removing this uh, <laughs> by making this into a number. And I want to actually point a question for you guys. What if there is a user, I imagine we're in real life, and there's a user who we don't know the age and the age actually doesn't matter that much. But it's an additional thing that we might want to have sometimes, right? So what if I don't want to pass an age? Well, there's clearly an issue, right? It says property age is missing on this type, and it's required in the user interface. Now, what does it mean to be required? It means that some fields or all the fields you define in your interface, they can either be required or not, they can either be required or optional. So it assumes it's required, because that's how we actually defined it. In order to make it optional, we had to put a question mark right after the name of the field. And now you see it doesn't give us an error anymore. Now what happens if I print or I console log, sorry, console log, the user dot age? Well, let's check this out. Let's open this again. And like you like I told you guys, we have to first build this. Um, it just built and then we have to run the tutorial.js. You see, it gives us as undefined because the optional type is either undefined or a number. So you see, this is how the age field in the user interface is defined, either a number or undefined. You might expect it to be null, but technically not, because undefined is a JavaScript type and it's used uh, in TypeScript for whenever we don't we didn't actually define a value for some sort of field or variable. So we could actually um, play around with this, we can say, okay, if uh, let's console log this if uh, there's no user dot age, so if user dot age is undefined, then we actually want to console log a message saying no age of the user. And if it isn't undefined, then we actually want to console log the age. You'll see that after this, if we built it again, and run the same thing, we should actually get a error message for it, which means that um, actually having type definitions in our code can lead to many conditional statements that you previously couldn't have in JavaScript, you have no idea how many times I have statements like this, where a piece of data can actually be null, and I'm constantly checking to see if it is because um, projects revolve around that whole concept. Now, what else can you actually put inside of an interface? Well, if you have any idea of what you can actually put inside of an object, then you have your answer, because objects can be defined in the exact way in which they um, can be created. So if I imagine in this user interface over here, 
I had a function, right? Imagine here, actually, in the actual object, I had a function called uh, greet, right? It's a function which um, we can actually use to uh, greet someone, right? And it comes with a little message over here. Uh, and with it, we can actually just console log um, the actual message. So I can say something like this, console log message. Now, why is it giving us an error, right? Why is it giving us an error? Actually, I should remove that. Uh, why is it giving us an error? Well, because we haven't defined any of the types. But if we didn't have TypeScript, we could easily set this up. And then over here, we could call user.greet and put something like hello over here. And whenever we called this, uh, this greet function would run and it would console log the message. However, it's given us an error because we haven't defined this specific function as a part of the user interface. So let's do that. So to define functions, it's a little bit weird, but at the same time, um, it's pretty uh, self explanatory. Um, we actually first define the name of the function. And we specify to TypeScript that this is a function by right after the name, we put a, a parentheses, right? Now, whatever we put here is what this function will return. So with this over here, this is actually just a console log. So it's not returning anything, right? So whenever you're not returning something in a function, TypeScript defines that type that return type as void. So you can put void because we're not actually returning anything, we're returning void. Now we do have uh, an argument to this function, which is a message. So we put over here that this function will have an argument of message. And we actually also define its type, like a string. Now, this over here, since it already uh, encompasses the type definition over here, there's no problem. But we could actually redefine this if we wanted to, we could actually put void over here as well. And here put string as well. If we put something else, if we put number, then you would see that this is a problem because it's not the same functions, right? So let's keep it how it was before. And let's save this, let's run this and let's see if the function is actually called. Uh, we have to build it and then run it and you can see it is actually called. Perfect. Okay, so I think this is a, everything kind of uh, important to know with interfaces. Uh, there's more complexity that is added um, with whenever you work with multiple types. And that's what I want to explore right now. So let's comment all of this out. And actually probably delete this. And I want to present you guys uh, the following scenario. Imagine we have this function called uh, print ID, right? And it's related to a an user. Uh, I wanted to actually print the or console log the ID of a specific user, and it takes in the actual ID of the user. Now, if you've ever worked with IDs before, you might know that IDs can vary in definitions, it can actually be a number, or it could be a string. No matter what, uh, I just want to console log it. So I'll say console log, um, the ID or some message saying ID is equal to the ID. Perfect. Now, it's asking us to define a type and I can define over here, for example, a string, right? And I could call this print ID function and put a string over here, like ID one, two, three. However, there are scenarios in which you also need this to be a number because maybe the ID is not ID one, two, three, it's a bunch of numbers, right? And obviously, you don't want to keep it as a string, you want to keep it as a number, because that might be the way that the data is coming to you. So with TypeScript, it's important to understand that sometimes, especially when you're dealing with a full stack app, um, data might be coming from the back end in ways that you might not expect. So you have to deal with that. So Whenever you have a situation like this, where this field can be either a string or a number, um, you can use what is known as a union, which is um, you combine multiple types and say that the combination of them can be attributed to this variable. So I can say that a, this ID field can be a string or a number. And now this doesn't give an error anymore. So this little thing over here kind of allows us to uh, maybe internally or in line, define a new type, which is a type 
uh, defined by the union of both a string and a number. Now, unions can be become really complex and annoying. For example, this could become, I don't know, it's a Boolean, it could become as well a, an array of uh, numbers, I don't know. Obviously, it's hard to come up with an example right now, but there are situations in which a variable can have a very complex type, which is a union of a bunch of different types. In that kind of situation, or if you actually just want to keep it simple and not have this union over here in the argument of the function, you can actually define a type for yourself. Now, we've kind of done that with an interface, right? With an interface, we've said user and then defined an object, right? However, the difference between what we're going to do now is that an interface is mostly done for objects. And what we're doing now is for single fields. So if I wanted to find this ID field to be a type that isn't one of the primitive types, I can, for example, use the type definition over here, which is also known as a type alias, and just say that um, this will have a type of ID field type. And it will be a union of a string and a number. And then I can pass this over here and reuse this maybe uh, anywhere inside of my application. And now it will always know that this can either be a string or a number. It accepts both. Now, since we've talked about uh, unions, we probably should talk about the opposite of union, right? A union basically gets two sets for those who've done set theory or have learned about Venn diagrams. <laughs> uh, a union has two different sets of data, right? And it accepts both of them, which is in this case, the string and the number. But what about the situation where you want to intersect uh, two types, right? You want to intersect those two sets. So a situation like this would be the following. Imagine we have uh, the two, the following two interfaces, right? We have an interface for now imagine that we have an interface for uh, a business partner. I don't know, it's a person or a person that is your partner in business. Um, and let's keep it simple. Let's actually just say that our business partner has two fields in this object. One is their name. And one is their um, credit score. I don't know, credit score. And that's a number. Now, there is another interface called uh, interface called um, user identity, right? And this is actually more general. So business partner will be used for objects uh, re related to a specific type of person in our website, it would be a specific type of business uh, of employee, so it would be a business partner, and user identity would contain the ID of a user and their email, which is something that everyone in the website should probably have, right. So we have two different types. And um, they have some intersection because a business partner whenever they have a user, they, they do have a user identity, right? So if I want to define this new type, right, this new type, which is a more general uh, representation of uh, an employee in a website, right, I can call this employee, um, it would be a combination of the values in this object and the values in this one. To do that, I could just use the concept of intersection, I can say that the employee is a business partner. And it intersects with the user identity object. Now, if I were to create a function over here, and imagine you want to sign a contract for this employee, right, you want to sign their contract, I could come over here and say const uh, sign contract. And then uh, define that you need to pass an employee over here. So employee. And we'll just console log a message saying, uh, contract signed by and then put uh, the employee name, which as you can see, just by the autocomplete, it includes the fields from both uh, interfaces, not just one. So we can get the em employee name. And we can say uh, something like with credit score equal to and then we add the credit score as well. Actually, uh, no, name and credit score in the same object. So actually, let's instead of say with email, because they are in different ones. So with email, um, equal to employee dot email, perfect. 
And you can see that if we were to call this, so sign contract, and we were to pass this object with the following fields, a name called Pedro, a credit score of 800, let's say I'm, I'm amazing, uh, an ID of 23 or 34, <laughs> uh, and an email of Pedro at gmail.com. Now, if we call this, um, let's just build it and Oh, there's an error. Okay, I have to do this. And also let's define the type of this as void because that's the return type. Uh, if I were to do this, build it and then run it again, you should see that um, it actually works. <laughs> there's a mistake in the string, but it actually works. So it actually concatenated both types It intersected both of them and created a new type, which is uh, it's not the union of both because that's the whole difference between intersection and union. Because if I were to do this, this would give us an error because employee is not uh, a, an object with fields of both types. It is either one of the types. So we can't have one of each over here. I could actually change this to credit score. And this would make more sense with the union type because then it would like over here, we could pass either the business partner object or the user identity. But in this case, uh, we want to have both fields of both objects. So we do keep it like this with an intersection sign. And you'll see this being used. Um, I, I see unions being used way more in projects. But this is also important. Um, and I think it's definitely important for you to understand. But one thing that is super important in TypeScript that we haven't talked about yet, and it's what we're going to be talking about right now, is the idea of enums, um, which is one of my favorite parts of, of uh, TypeScript in general, you can actually replicate this in JavaScript as well, if you if you ever want to do that, but enums is a very easy and handy way for you to define a set of named constants, and it will actually improve the readability and usability of your code that uses those constants. So if you don't, if you didn't get what I meant by that, uh, let me explain. Imagine that um, you want to have a function over here uh, and call it print error message, right? And this is probably going to be called whenever you have some error scenario in your website, like whenever you click a button and you call some data and it comes out wrong. Um, and it should take in an error. And it should print out a message based on that. Right? So let's say error. Now, um, imagine that there might be multiple types of errors, right? The error could be, um, for example, an unauthorized user error, it can be an unauthenticated user error, it can be an error about the user not existing, right? It can be imagine that this is probably going to be called whenever you're trying to sign in into an account, right? That's an error. So let's think about this, like this error over here can be multiple things. And let's note it down so you guys can understand it. Um, the error can be um, an unauthorized error. So the user is not authorized. And um, user doesn't exist. If the user is trying to sign in, probably there's an error for wrong credentials. And um, yeah, or probably like an internal error, something just happened, not none of the other ones, right? So it can be either of this ones. And depending on which one it is, we want to console log a different message. So we could obviously come over here. And whatever this is returned, we could uh, do something related to that. But the thing is, we want to define a specific set of constants for this, which is going to define all the different types of errors that they can be. So an enum could be a great example of what you can use to make this easier. We can say uh, enum uh, login error. And we can define over here different types of constants or of errors that can exist. So for example, the login error can be an unauthorized error. And we can define a string that is going to match that. So I'm going to say unauthorized. This over here, not necessarily uh, will be what's going to be printed. Um, <clears throat> you could print that, but it's not necessarily it's just a, a value for um, your enum key. So then uh, let's create one for user doesn't no, actually user don't no, no user. <laughs> it's a better way. So user doesn't exist. Let's call it no user. And let's pass in over here. Uh, user doesn't exist. 
or actually let's just pass in no user uh, and then wrong credentials we'll say wrong credentials and again wrong credentials and finally let's do an internal error so internal and internal perfect now we can see that this error is uh, of type uh, login error ena which means that um, if we wanted to display a different error message depending on what which one of these types it is we could easily just come over here and say um, if um, error is equal to login error dot unauthorized then we can just console log uh, a message saying user not authorized so you see it's pretty easy for you to match this with this you define the type of error and you define the condition that should happen when that error happens now let's do it for the other ones uh, let's say if error is equal to uh, no user we'll say console log uh, no user was found with that username something like that now i'll fill up the other ones and i'll be back in a second okay as you can see we can check for all of the different errors we can even put an else for the internal one or we can just default it to be internal by also checking if it's internal but um that's fine um we'll just also console log actually we'll remove this over here and now let's call this function let's call print error no uh, error message so how would we what would we put over here well, we can actually just straight up use the enum. So I can print out a message for the uh, wrong credentials one, right? And I can save this, build it, run it, and you'll see that it will say the correct combination. Um, I could change this to be uh, the no user one. And you'll see that it will actually change based on that as well. So um, this is the basics of enums. Enums are great for this kind of stuff. It is great for... Uh, defining i don't know situations like directions different strings that might or like keys for specific uh, parts of your website stuff like that um it's probably one of the most used things in typescript that i use personally i love them and i think they're extremely useful now one of the last things i want to talk about um in typescript is probably one of the most complicated to understand which is the concept of generic types and that's probably something that a lot of people just uh, breeze over and don't actually learn, but they see it on our day-to-day -day, um, working um, hours. Um, so I wanted to just explain to you guys, uh, because generics are actually a very powerful feature that many programming languages, including TypeScript, uh, use because it allows you to write flexible, reusable functions and classes that can be used uh, with different types. They kind of help you ensure type safety without losing the flexibility of working with various different data types. Um, and I came up with a pretty, I, I believe to be um, relatable and simple example that demonstrates how to use generics in TypeScript. So we're gonna be creating a storage class, a storage container class, which um, will contain different uh, data types, right? And uh, we can make different versions of this class with different types. So we can make one with the string type, one with the um, number type, you'll understand as we build it. But uh, to start this off, let's start off by just creating a class and call it storage container. Now, this class, whenever we define a normal class that uh, could be of a type, we could pass over here an interface, for example, we could pass in a user interface like the one we created. But like I said, um, this should actually be um, accepting various different data types. So we're going to be using a generic. And to define a generic over here, we pass in a T, as you can see, this will stand for, uh, it's kind of a placeholder for um, the different data types that can be used. So over here, we'll create a variable called contents. And we'll define it to be a array of this T uh, type. Now, this is a private function, so I'll make this private. And contents will just be uh, whatever variable, like whatever value values we're holding inside of here. We're going to return this um, at the end. This is going to be a very simple class. 
Now for a constructor uh, in this class, we'll just say this dot contents is equal to an empty array. So we'll start off with an empty array. And as we use this class, we'll fill in this uh, contents array, which is going to be the actual storage system, the storage uh, container. Now we're going to have two functions inside of this, we're going to have an add item function, which is going to add something to this contents array. And there's going to be a get item function, which as you might know, will add, will get an item. Now, we're using this generic type, because we don't want to make this be just for strings, or for numbers. So over here, inside of this, we'll have an item as an argument. So the item we would add, and instead of putting string or number, we'll add the T. And like you might expect, this will return void, because the whole point of this function is just to um, push something to the end of the contents array. Right? Now, this get item, will have an argument, which is going to be the index for uh, which item in our storage we want to get. So it will be a number. And it needs to return back either the item itself, or nothing or undefined because uh, maybe it will actually not find that item. Now inside of get item, let's just return uh, this dot contents and then return the item inside of the index, right? So this is our very simple storage container. Now, this is where you guys start understanding the power of generics, which is, we can actually make multiple different uh, instances of this class, for example, we can make one for uh, usernames, right? And say new storage container. Now usernames is a string, right? It's going to be a string. So we define what type is going to fill in for this T over here, this generic by passing it over here. So I'm going to say string. And this would generate a version of this an instance of this class, where we can uh, add an item like Pedro tech, and then uh, probably add something else as well. I'm going to add one more uh, Pedro tech, uh, echo BR. Um, and then I'm going to say usernames dot get item. And you'll see that if I try to get the first item, this should return the correct information. Uh, it doesn't Oh, we have to print this out. Sorry about that. Um, console dot log, and then print this out. Perfect. Uh, you see Pedro tech. So that worked, right? Now we can also make uh, another instance of this, which isn't with strings, it's actually with numbers. So I can come over here, and I can say number. And this is actually age of no, actually, age is not a good example, maybe, uh, I don't know, friends count. Let's imagine that <laughs> this stores for each item in the array, it stores the amount of friends a user might have. So instead of adding strings over here, we can add numbers, we can add 23, we can add 56, or 678. And obviously, we have to pass this in. And you'll see that the type definition actually worked, right? Um, it doesn't, it, it didn't allow me when it was usernames, because username is a string storage container. But when I change it to the number one, it works. And if I print out both, you'll see that both work. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, did I actually Yes, I'm still returning usernames. Um, let's try again. And yeah, it works. So generics are meant for this are meant for uh, basically reusing some sort of class or object um, that can have multiple different data types as arguments to the data that is present in that class, and making different versions of it, you should see it in every single library that you use if you use it in Re a, a react library, if you use a view library, if you use a, a angular library, all of them under the hood use stuff like this. Now, this is basically all of the complicated topics though I left the like a minor thing that you should see should understand to the end. Uh, but it's also pretty easy to understand. Uh, because you, you will see this when you're working with TypeScript. Um, however, it's not that important. So I left it for last, which is the idea of uh, read only variables. So uh, if you were to create an interface, for example, for an employee, 
um, just like this, uh, we could define some properties for it, right? We could define that this employee um, could have a name, like a string, uh, and a department, which is also a string, I don't know. But also, it has some fields that they shouldn't be altered, because they are inherently not mutable. They're strings that are defined once and should never change. For example, uh, employee ID, right? Technically, you shouldn't be able to change the ID. Maybe you do, but I don't think you should. Uh, a better example would be a start date, right? Uh, a user can't have a, can't change their start date after they started. That's a, a predetermined thing, which by the way, I, I don't think I mentioned, but you can use the date type for dates. Um, now, how do I enforce that when I were to create here an employee uh, and set it to equal to employee over here, and I were to uh, define all of this stuff, uh, well, actually, I need to put an equal sign. So let me define an employee here. Uh, start date equals to new date. I'll just set it to right now. Um, and then name, let's set it to Pedro. And then department, let's set it to finance, right? If I were to create this employee, I want to be able to change the name field to Jessica, imagine I change my name to Jessica, but I don't, I want to not be able to change my employee ID, right? Right now I can still do it. Employee, employee ID is equal to uh, this number. And then if I were to print the employee in the end, you should see that it actually alters everything, right? As you can see. However, I want to make uh, both this and this field be read only, <laughs> not mutable. So by the name, you should see that I can add this read only thing over here, which actually allows for that to happen. And it gives us a red squiggly line for the employee ID, meaning it doesn't actually allow me to uh, mutate this, it says that um, cannot assign employee ID, uh, cannot assign to employee ID because it's a read only property. So I can remove this and I'll know that I shouldn't be able to change that. And now you see that it actually fixes it. So yeah, that's that's pretty much the last thing I wanted to go over. Um, I've made TypeScript videos in the past, um, especially videos related to specific uses of TypeScript. So I'm linking up here a video I made on using TypeScript for uh, backend applications. So like setting up a TypeScript uh, application with Express and Node.js. Um, if you're interested in that, go check that out. But more importantly, I've also made extensive videos on using TypeScript with React because I do think you, if you're gonna be using React, you have to be using TypeScript. I don't use it in some of my videos to make it more understandable for everyone, even those who don't know TypeScript. But in the real world, you definitely need to use TypeScript because type safety is one of the most important things. So that's basically it. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like down below and comment what you want to see next. Subscribe because I'm putting a lot of effort into this channel. Um, I came back, I uh, just hit 200,000 subs and I couldn't be more grateful for everyone. Um, and I'm really motivated to post a lot of videos for you guys. So I'm interested to see in the description or in the comments down below uh, what you guys want me to make. And yeah, that's, that's basically it. Really hope you guys enjoyed it and I see you guys next time. Yeah.